Um, okay, sorry for making everybody wait. Um, I'm really appreciative of everybody that is willing to come and give their time for events like this. I think that democracy is so important. And so um, I do really appreciate you um, all joining us tonight. As we gather, we're reminded that we are hosting this webinar on land that is the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the neutral peoples. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening Waterloo Region, Ontario, and Canada. We are grateful for the opportunity to be here and to reaffirm our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. We also acknowledge that people are joining us from all across Turtle Island. For just a couple of pieces of information, uh, we just wanted to ask that people generally stay on mute so that there isn't a lot of additional noise. Uh, if you would like to ask questions, then please let either me or Mats, who will be joining us momentarily, uh, know. Um, and then we'll be sure to uh, do our best to, to make sure that you get that opportunity to ask. Um, and then you can unmute at that point. We're recording the meeting and, and then we'll post it to our YouTube channel. If you're uncomfortable with that, then please do let me know. Uh, myself, Teresa and Matt have all worked to put together these, um, these chats. And we're, we're Green Party volunteers. We do not work for or represent the Green Party in any way. And there have been no staff or candidates involved in the organizing or preparing of questions. We simply organize this to strengthen the Green Party. Um, and we'll also post more information about upcoming Q&As. Uh, and I do want to flag that on September 3rd, which is just two days from now, there is a deadline um, that you be a member of the Green Party of Canada. It can be easy to get confused about whether you're a, a member for the Green Party of Ontario. So if you have any doubts, do um, ask Teresa or myself and we can, uh, we can confirm that you are indeed a member. So at this point, I would like to turn it over to Mike Morris for a brief intro. Thanks, Stacey. Oh, with a bit of feedback so far. That sounds a bit better. Awesome. Uh, wonderful to see you all. Uh, good to see you all again. Uh, um, Dimitri, thank you for, for being with us tonight. We've been doing these every week the last number of weeks, but the fact is the closer we get to the end of the campaign, the, uh, the more and more demands I'm sure there are on your time and that of the other candidates as, as well. So I uh, really appreciate you making some time to talk with uh, some folks from across Waterloo, Waterloo region. Um, and so as a brief introduction, the fact is, I don't know Dimitri super well. I think Dimitri, we spoke for the first time just a few a few weeks ago. Um, but I'm really glad that uh, Dimitri, you're in the in the race. Uh, we now have eight candidates left in the race. Uh, Dimitri uh, is uh, a lawyer, an activist, a journalist. Uh, has been a candidate with the Greens before, back in 2015. Has been on shadow cabinet before, and so has a long history in the party. And I think with a few others is bringing. Um, a conversation in the campaign as well uh, around uh, party party policies, and uh, and so I'm really glad that Dimitri, you can uh, uh, be with us here uh, this this evening. So uh, with that, thank you all again uh, for being with us, uh, Dimitri. Thanks for being open to an open-ended type conversation for some folks to get you to know you better on this call, and then for those that join afterwards on on YouTube as well. So, Dimitri, over over to you. Oh, and as I do that, the last thing I'll share is I do have another uh, commitment. So I want you to know, as I leave before uh, the end of the session, it won't be for anything that you said that was offensive to me, <laughs> um, uh, but, but rather for that other commitment. So with that, over to you. Thanks, Mike. It always freaks me out when someone leaves after my mouth stops wagging. But anyway, thank you for that introduction and same to you, Stacey. And uh, 
I appreciate that you've been doing this once a week. That shows a, a really impressive level of engagement. If you've been doing that during the entire course of the campaign, then you deserve a medal because this thing has been going on for quite some time. Uh, it, we are now in the final month. Uh, it seems like the contest began an eternity ago. Uh, for me personally, it, it, it began in February when I decided to enter the race. And I, uh, I uh, formally announced my participation in the leadership contest in early March. And we managed to get off two events at the Université, Université de Montréal, uh, one involving David Murner and a candidate who's no longer in the race, Dylan Percival Maxwell. And then we had another one which was partly in person, partly by Zoom at uh, McGill. Uh, and, then within the next, and then the next day we went into confinement. And we were, all of us, uh, obliged to uh, participate uh, electronically in this leadership contest up until around mid-June. And then when the confinement was, you know, partially lifted, at least to the point where we could do in-person meetings again, I hit the road and I started my, uh, my I had my first meet and greet in, in Peterborough in, uh, in June. I drove down from Montreal. And since then I have done, uh, by my count, around 53 meet and greets uh, from uh, Vancouver Island in Nanaimo all the way to Quebec City. And uh, for me personally, they have been, uh, I think, more educational for me than they were for the members who met me, because this really is an extraordinarily uh, thoughtful uh, base that we have within our party, a very, a very sophisticated group of voters who are constantly <laughs> enlightening those of us who, uh, who uh, you know, uh, step forward and, and, and seek their in premature of approval as leadership candidates. And so whatever happens, I can say with the utmost confidence that I personally, uh, I'm a better person for having participated in this race. And I feel like I owe all of you a debt of gratitude uh, for what I've learned in this process. Um, I'll say a little bit about myself, although I've, I've probably said quite a bit about it, more than enough than I would like to uh, say in the course of this race, uh, it, it gets kind of repetitive to keep talking about your background. And I think some of the people on this call will certainly know at least something about my background. And if you have further questions afterwards, I'd be happy to answer them. But I was born and raised in London, Ontario, just down the street from Waterloo. Uh, I, I, my parents came over to uh, Canada from Greece uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War and the Civil War that followed uh, without having any uh, high school education or any capacity to speak English. And they did it because the country was really in desperate straits, not because they had any burning desire to leave Greece. And they arrived by boat in Halifax and eventually ended up in London, Ontario, where the whole extended family congregated. And a number of people in my family, including my parents, started uh, you know, their lives in London by working in a McCormick's biscuit factory on Dundas. And uh, eventually they did what all Greek immigrants do. They scrounged together enough money to start a, a diner, which was owned by you know, uh, four or five different families in my extended family. And I grew up in uh, a Greek diner and uh, have many fond memories of that. Managed to uh, scrounge together enough money to put myself through University at Western because uh, my parents weren't in a position to pay my tuition. And, uh, and then graduated uh, to legal studies at the University of Toronto in 1988 and graduated in 1991 and uh, took the most lucrative opportunity I could find in the hope that I would discharge my student debts as quickly as possible. And that for me fortunately was a position on Wall Street in a firm called Sullivan and Cromwell. And I spent four years in that firm's New York and Paris offices, serving the likes of Goldman Sachs and other major financial institutions predominantly, uh, and decided that that was not remotely satisfying to me from a professional and personal pr perspective. And I really didn't want to remain in the United States either, uh, especially New York City, which was a, a really sort of intensely ruthless competitive environment uh, and one that, uh, really wasn't in accordance with the, 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 the ethics that I had been raised with as a child, which is, you know, the sense of humility about your background and, uh, and, and being aware of the, the you know, the, 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 the need of those, uh, the, the obligation of those of us who are more fortunate in society uh, to take care of our most vulnerable members. That really wasn't an ethic that permeated the legal profession uh, where I, I started my career in New York City. So I came home and I uh, joined a law firm called Siskins based in London, Ontario. And when I arrived there, they said, uh, you know, we, we we're looking for somebody who has experience in corporate matters because there's a real need in Canada for 
lawyers to pursue people in the stock markets who are committing fraud. Uh, and at that time, it was, and to this day, very uh, perilous sort of uh, uh, regulatory environment for Canadian investors. In fact, David Dodge, the governor of the Bank of Canada, uh, when I started working here as a class actions lawyer, focusing on securities fraud, described Canada as the Wild West of, of lax securities regulation. That was the reputation it had internationally. And some of you may remember scandals like Briex, a gold company that was an a, a pure fraud and uh, collapsed in a $6 billion disaster back in the early 2000s. Um, another company, Nortel, which was the darling of the TSX for many years, collapsed in a cascade of fraud. And you know, in your um, own neck of the woods, there was of course research in motion uh, back in 2007, uh, at which point research in motion was uh, the darling really of the business community in Canada my firm uh, gave me the resources to uh, investigate whether Canadian corporations were engaged in a form of fraud known as stock options backdating. I won't get into the technicalities of what that is, but basically uh, it's a way of enriching executives that is not uh, in accordance with the, uh, the rules of the Toronto Stock Exchange. And a professor in the United States had developed a methodology for determining whether companies were engaged in this sort of fraud uh, so I put together a team of people who applied that methodology to a thousand companies listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange and determined the probability that they, those companies were engaged in a fraud and research in motion was uh, at the top of the list. Uh, there was an extraordinarily high probability according to the statistical analysis that their stock options were manipulated uh, and in a way that was enriching the executives to the detriment of the shareholders. So in 2006, I was retained by a uh, the Iron Workers Ontario Pension Fund, which had a significant stock holding and research in motion. And, uh, and uh, we uh, brought an action against uh, Mr. Balsili, Mike Lazaridis, alleging that they had engaged in stock option manipulation. And they immediately responded by suing me personally for defamation for $55 million. And um, fortunately, my client did not bail out on me. They, they instructed me to proceed with the litigation. And uh, six months later, uh, Mr. Balsili and Mr. Lazaridis paid $10 million out of their own pockets to, re to reimburse the company for illicit gains from their manipulated stock options. And they withdrew the claim against me without my having to retract a single word or pay a penny of compensation or utter uh, a, a, a single sentiment of apology because their claim was simply uh, an attempt at naked intimidation of, uh, of the counsel of their shareholder. This is the kind of experience I had as a class actions lawyer. I, I, you know, intimidation was a common feature of what we had to confront when we took on corporate Canada. And that was just one particularly egregious example of it. But it was, it was uh, something which uh, has informed my approach to understanding the crisis that we're now in. I've come to believe that the reason why we are in this crisis, the reason why we have been unable to resolve the climate emergency and deal with it effectively is corporate power. We have an economy that externalizes or richly compensates people who externalize the cost of their production relentlessly. And then those people having acquired their wealth by foisting upon all of us the costs of their business operations, use that wealth in order to obstruct the actions we need to take in order to preserve the livability of our planet. That's the core of the problem. It's not that we don't have the technological solutions. It's not that we don't have the economic resources to transition to a renewable energy economy and a sustainable economy. It's a lack of political will, which has been engendered by a corporate class and a billionaire class that are absolutely determined to perpetuate their wealth and their privilege, even at the expense of the future of our children. So I came into this race because I think that my experiences dealing with the corporate sector, particularly here in Canada, have prepared me for the task, the unpleasant work, frankly, of overcoming the resistance of big business to the changes we desperately need to save uh, our society and preserve the future of our children. Uh, and I think that that's what I, uh, that I bring to the table amongst this field of extraordinarily uh, talented ca candidates. Um, I, I wanna say a few words about the progress of this campaign. Um, we, uh, we received today, uh, and you'll, I'm sure you'll see something in the press about this in the next 24 hours or so, the finance uh, results or the fundraising results for all of the campaigns. Uh, it was delivered to us about three hours ago 
by the uh, headquarters of the, the Green Party in Ottawa. And we, as a campaign, couldn't be happier with the results uh, we've achieved within the last month. Um, we are currently, we were in second place in fund fundraising uh, for donors by 31st. I mean, in second place, but we've extended our lead and in March we raised more money and uh, generated more donors than in all of the five months of the campaign prior to that time. And from $2,110 at the end of July to $112,000 at the end of August. And uh, what I'm particularly uh, encouraged by is that we didn't actually begin fundraising until June 2nd because of the pandemic. Um, we also are very encouraged by the fact that our average donation size is falling considerably. Uh, we're now down uh, to $117 in average donation compared to other candidates who are over, you know, 181 and even $200. We're very encouraged by the fact that people who don't have deep pockets are coming to our campaign in large numbers. We have now almost a thousand donors. Uh, we had uh, the second best month overall in the campaign. We're neck and neck, at least in August, with Anime Paul, who is the, uh, the person, or the candidate who's raised the most funds thus far. And, um, and I, I, I feel a momentum, not only in terms of number of donors and in dollars raised, but also in our social media uh, presence and in the number of people who come to us and have said that they've joined the Green Party because they're inspired by what this campaign is trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of people come up uh, from the NDP. They've said they've, they've told us they've been lifelong members of the party, uh, but they're fed up with the complacency and the centrism and the sellouts of their leadership. We've heard that from people coming over from the Liberal Party. We have people on our campaign team who are very experienced, young but very experienced organizers uh, who are inspired by what we're doing. And we have a lot of people coming over to our campaign who were never engaged in the political process. And there's a lot of Canadians out there who fit that description. Eight million people did not vote in the last election, even though they were eligible to do so. And I think that is because they feel that they have no stake in the political system. They're not inspired by their candidates. And we're trying to change that. Uh, you know, when I got on the call, there was a discussion happening about growing the party. Uh, I th think that is foremost in the minds of members around the country, and understandably so. I think the way that we do that is we carve out for our space we come out for ourselves space on the political spectrum that no one else is occupying and to my mind you know that i am an eco-socialist that i am a leftist uh that i believe that the core values of the party fundamentally embody uh a left-wing socialist progressive agenda non-violent respect for diversity, ecological wisdom, sustainability. These are the stuff about uh, positioning ourselves as the most progressive party in parliament by a wide margin. Uh, there are millions of Canadians in this country who are frustrated by the fact that they don't have a voice and they feel that the political class is selling out their children, is uh, mired in incrementalism, hypocrisy, uh, and in some cases, is out and out obsequiousness towards the most wealthy Canadians. Uh, we serve a lot of that Trudeau government. And they want somebody uh, to come forward and put forward a program unlike any that we've seen in our lifetime that responds to the dire uh, needs of the moment. We need to be radical. Our party in its origins is radical. And radical simply means getting to the root of things. And if anything defines what we as Greens are, it is that we get to the root causes of the problems confronting us and we figure out how to fix them. And that requires us to be, uh, in this day and age, uh, bold and uh, uncompromising. So that's uh, what I uh, am going to continue to advocate for in terms of the direction of the party, always recognizing that at the end of the day, uh, it will be the members who will decide what the program of this party is going to be going forward. I and my campaign team are articulating a vision, but it will be up to us uh, if I'm accorded the privilege of being the leader of this party, to persuade the members to support uh, the specifics of that vision going forward. So uh, I, I look forward to engaging you all in a robust discussion this evening. And uh, you can talk to me about any aspect of our platform or 
you know, if there's anything on your mind, uh, anything that I haven't mentioned that you want to talk about, please feel free to do so. Thank you for that introduction, Dimitri. And I'll just uh, reinstate for, for those of us who are who have joined us later. Uh, feel free to chat with me or Matt uh, and indicate that you have a question and then we'll do our best to uh, make sure that Dimitri is able to ask all of those. So we will start with our first question. James uh, will ask that question. Dimitri, hi. Hi, James. Um, so thanks very much for you, you, um, your introduction there. And I really like the notion that you, I, I think I agree with just about everything that you're sort of talking about there. You're treading on some dangerous I think James froze. Story that they can get behind and that they can say, yes, I will come with you and see your vision, right? And Is it just, um, is that? Here. I'm over here. Okay. Hang on. Right. Hang on. Here we go. All right. So sorry. Uh, it's okay. Okay. So I'm sorry about that. So um, we've seen in the United States with someone like Bernie Sanders, a similarly, you know, let's do this radical kind of change in the way that we do things, right? And we can all sort of get behind that. Maybe everybody that's on this particular forum right now can get behind that. But I still think that the Green Party suffers from an image issue that people see us as Birkenstock wearing hippies that just hug trees and, and have no good policies, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think you and you, your team and your platform can do to tell a restorative story that people can get behind? Well, um, so much to say. I don't know where to begin. I mean, first of all, I think that it is true that... Um, you know, there's a certain image that the corporate media likes to cultivate about us as Greens. I think they have a very difficult time doing that with me because of my background in uh, corporate law and the securities markets. And in fact, I was, I was named by a Canadian Lawyer Magazine as one of the 25 most influential lawyers in Canada and one of the 50 most influential persons in Canadian business. So I'm not exactly uh, the stereotype of a Green Party leader. And I think that that's, that's, that's helpful. It's a good thing. Um, but in terms of energizing people, I think the way we energize people is speaking to the things that, that really they're quite uh, concerned about and that they feel are, you know, the issues that they feel are not being addressed. And I think heart, front and center, front and center in our society today is the crisis of inequality. It's something that we as a party haven't talked about a lot. And I, every, every single meeting, every meet and greet I've had, you know, when I've raised the issue of inequality, I found that people have responded to that with a lot of passion and, and concern because it is out of control in this country. It's absolutely obscene that we have 10 Canadians controlling $65 billion of wealth and we have tens of thousands of people who are homeless on any given night, living in the streets, even in the dead of winter. And we have millions of Canadians who are living in poverty, a great many of them children. People are upset about this and rightly so. You know, we have a tax system that is extraordinarily generous to the most affluent members of our society. We're the only country in the G7 that doesn't have an estate tax. Not a penny of a billionaire's wealth has to be paid in tax when that billionaire bequeaths his or her estate uh, to his or her heirs. You know, so I'm calling for us to have a 45% estate tax. I'm calling for us to have a top marginal tax rate on income over 500,000 of 75%. And you know, the right will say, well, that's, that's extraordinary. That's extreme, 75%. Actually, by historical standards, it isn't. You know, for much of the post-World War II period, it was in excess of 90% in Canada and yeah. the United States. Can, can I interrupt just, just sure. quickly? Sure. What you, just, what you just did there is you sort of said, you know, a, a corporate, a, a, an income tax of 75% over 500,000 
And if we went with, uh, you know, people earning $500,000 or more per year are about 0.1% of the population of Canada. There's not that many people, right? Um, I still feel like those are facts. Those, that's data, that's numbers. And what people need is a story to get behind. People need to feel like you can, you know, I, I hear this guy, Dimitri, talking and I just want to, I just want to join, right? And I don't know that, I don't know that numbers do it. Do, can you see a different way? Well, I, look, I, I don't think we should be drowning people in statistics. I agree with that. But the story of inequality is one that few people are very passionate about. And it's hard to tell the story without, you know, putting forward at least a few key statistics. People need to know these basic numbers and figures about our society. And you say like less than 1% make over $500,000 a year. That's true, but this isn't primarily. My, my, my views about inequality are not simply driven by wealth redistribution. They're driven, about, they're driven also by my concern about how the wealthy are corrupting our democratic process. And when you have so much wealth concentrated in so few hands, people can bring that wealth to bear to shape and manipulate the public conversation to their advantage and shape and manipulate the politicians and even our institutions, our academic institutions, which have become increasingly reliant upon the so-called philanthropy of the ultra wealthy. The type of research they're doing, the type of advocacy they're doing is being influenced by the agenda of the wealthiest members of our society. So it's not simply a question of how many ultra wealthy people out there. The bigger question for democracy is what are they doing with that wealth? How are they using that to undermine the popular will? I think that that's a story that really resonates with people. It's certainly the reaction that I've been getting in interacting with members of the party around the country and people who are coming to the party uh, and responding to that. You know, I think there's also a, a story, a very compelling story to be told about the profoundly unjust nature of our foreign policy. You know, people are very upset about the fact that Canada has become essentially a servant of the United States government. That's what it is. We do whatever the United States government effectively wants us to do, and we are not acting as a sovereign nation, and we're giving extraordinarily heinous human rights violators like Saudi Arabia, which, to which we're selling weapons made in my hometown, a free pass, while holding the official enemies of the United States to the highest standard. And this is corroding our moral authority on the international stage, and people can see this. We just lost for the second time in a row a bid for a seat on the United Nations Security Council because our credibility has been shredded. This is a story that people are very, you know, concerned about. So I think, sure, we don't statistics. I, th I also treat, you know, I, I feel that voters are constantly being underestimated by the political class, and we're talking to them like children. We'd be speaking, talking to them like adults, and give them the information they need that the mainstream media has not given them. I think they'll appreciate that. Uh, so, and as I say, I, I, the, the proof, the proof is in the pudding. If you look at the results. Uh, that our campaign is generating in terms of donors, in terms of followers, in terms of donations. Uh, I think that our message is resonating. Thanks. I appreciate that answer. Okay. So Mel has a question as well. Mel? Yes. Uh, hey, Dimitri, thank you so much for joining us. I, I really enjoyed your, your contribution so far. Um, you know, I'm going to build a little bit, you know, on what James has already mentioned. Uh, it kind of ties into the, the little speech I was giving on my soapbox just as you were joining us. Um, you know, I, I was talking about the need to grow the Green Party to, so that we can ultimately uh, exercise more influence to actually advance our agenda, right? And, you know, it's one thing to, you know, come up with it with all these policies, which we think are great, but if we can't actually you know, influence, um, you know, the direction of, uh, of government policy, you know, it be, it's really just an academic exercise. So I, I'm wondering, you know, we need to, I think one of the most important things for the new Green Party leader is to, we need somebody who can grow the party, who can get more Canadians to buy into our agenda and see us as a practical alternative and to ultimately help us to elect more Green MPs. So as the new Green Party leader, how do you plan to achieve that? Well, partly it is a question of your policy orientation and, and your political orientation. So I think it's very important that we as a party, uh, as I said at the outset, car carve out a space that is unique to us. You know, in the last election, we had a slogan uh, of neither left nor right, but forward. And we were quite consciously, and I don't think it was just in the last election, I think it was in the last two or three elections, we're positioning ourselves either explicitly or implicitly as a party of the center. 
I don't think that that's a winning electoral strategy. I mean, we're basically fighting for the scraps that are left over from the liberal and NDP uh, uh, parties, which are quite explicitly themselves uh, positioning themselves as being in the center. And we're never going to out liberal the liberals. We're never going to win that fight with the liberal party trying to occupy the center. What's basically happened is that the left of the political spectrum has been vacated. And most Canadians are fundamentally progressive in their orientation. They're very sympathetic to that kind of a platform. And we should be seizing that opportunity rather than trying to position ourselves as a party of the center. So I think that that is something that is definitely going to help us grow the party. Uh, secondly, I think the way we go about conducting elections and the way we uh, govern ourselves as a party could be a potential of great inspiration to Canadians. I think we want to. I think we should be trying to democratize our party to a, lot, a much greater degree. So one of the, some of the things I'd like to do is I'd like to give the members the right to determine who's going to be in shadow cabinet. I think they should elect the members of shadow cabinet directly. I think the members should be electing directly the deputy leaders. I don't think the leaders should be doing this. Ultimately, these are things that we should be devolving power to the base of the party to the greatest possible degree. People will really get inspired by a democratized party that is setting a new standard for grassroots governance. And I think that the, from a transparency perspective, we can do much better. Uh, you know, the federal council has uh, developed an unfortunate habit of holding many of its more uh, important discussions in camera. You know, and there was a great, one of the most respected jurists in the United States Supreme Court Louis Brandeis once said that the best disinfectant is sunlight. And I couldn't agree more with that. You, you shine a light on what our governance structures are doing, give people insight and direct input into the decisions that are being made in the, fund, in the, in the core organs of the party, then they will uh, have more of a stake in it and be more inspired by participation in the party. So transparency and democratization, I think, have to be things that we're focused upon and we should be setting a new standard in that regard. And finally, there's sort of some, you know, very basic nuts and bolts things we have to do. Principally, we have to help sustain our EDAs between elections because well over half of them are defunct during the electoral cycle. And they only become active, if at all, when, we, when the writ drops or shortly before the writ drops. We cannot as a party make the best use of our limited resources when we have you know, more than half of our EDAs remaining defunct between elections. So I think that this is gonna require the leader and the other uh, persons around the leadership, shadow cabinet members, the deputy leaders, to devote uh, you know, a, a fixed amount of their time to direct interaction with the executives of the EDAs around the country. And we need to allocate a certain proportion of our budget every year to sustaining EDAs and giving them the financial resources they need in order to actually function because that does actually require some financial expenditure. Uh, but m whatever we can do to give, give the ADAs li life and sustain them throughout the electoral cycle will go a long way to helping us to grow the party and to be more competitive in the elections. I've been told, yeah, I've been told that I have the opportunity to ask a follow-up question, so I hope everyone else will indulge me. Um, you know, one of the things that attracted me to the Green Party, you know, until I ultimately joined a year ago, was that the Green Party advertised itself as a party with, that was neither of the left or of the right, it, that they were not really married to a particular uh, political philosophy, but rather they are you know, guided by, you know, they, they, they were a very pragmatic party. They wanted to find practical solutions to achieve certain goals. And, you know, some of the goals that you've kind of described, like, yeah, you know, you talked about the great a, a economic inequality that you'd like to see addressed. We're all very interested in, in, in you know, in the environment, uh, you know, and, you know, we could go on and on. These are all goals and not philosophies, right? Uh, how we get there, there could be a number of different paths that allow us to get there. And, you know, so, uh, you know, you... Uh, Earlier in your in your um, in your uh, introduction, you described yourself as a socialist, right? Which you know kind of messages sends a different message to people. You know, it, it doesn't say you know I'm open to di different types of different types of options on the table to achieve these 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 uh, important goals. And I'm concerned that it tells people that aha, he's he's one of those. I'm going to put him in this box here. And you, we're, we're going to turn off people, you know, a lot of the population who really do share the same goals as you and I do, right? Um, you know, I'm wondering if, you know, if my 
if my understanding of the stance of the, of the uh, Green Party is, is, is an error, or if maybe it, we're, we're just taught, we're splitting hairs and, and, and maybe not just getting caught up in semantics, right? Would you reconsider, like, I, I consider the Greens a progressive party. We're working towards these goals like, you know, justice, you know, reconciliation for Indigenous peoples, the environment, all these things, right? And I'm, I'm frankly, I don't care whether it's done by a large government program or whether it's done through some clever uh, market mechanism, as long as it achieves the goals that, that are important to us, right? Is that the way you see it? Or do you see yourself, or do you see the Green Party really needing to occupy the, you know, uh, like, you, you know, I, uh, you know a, a big government uh, socialist, uh, you know, um, you know uh, niche? Well, I think, first of all, we should always be stressing when we communicate with voters, the, we should lead with our platform and not with a label. So whether you call yourself a socialist, a centrist, a progressive, what it may be, whatever you may consider yourself to be on the political spectrum, what people really need to understand in concrete terms is how your party's policies are going to affect their lives. And that's what we should be leading with and emphasizing. And that's what I try to do. I try to talk as much as possible about, uh, you know, and, 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 but, but in ways that aren't overly complicated the core policies of the party and how that will impact Canadians positively. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not afraid to say I'm a socialist. That doesn't mean I'm not willing to work with other people who may not identify as socialists, but I, I don't think I should be shy about saying what my political orientation is. That's what it is. And, you know, and people have said to me, well, Dimitri, if you use this label, it's going to scare people off. Well, you know, the green party is a label. Green is a label. It's no less a label than socialist. And, you know, one could make an argument, that the green label has presented a certain disadvantage to us because it's conveyed to some Canadians, significant proportion of the voting population that we're a one issue party and that the only thing we care about is the environment. So I think that whatever language you use uh, to describe your party, there, you, you know, you, you're taking a risk of alienating some voters. Using the green label actually alienates some voters. You can't avoid that problem. The way to deal with the problem is to explain to people in concrete terms what that label will mean for them. Uh, and so that's what I try to do. Uh, and I don't think that this, and, and you know, at a more philosophical level, just putting aside the question of tactics and whether we should use labels, green, socialist, whatever it may be, I actually don't think that a market-oriented approach is going to save us. I don't believe that we can rely upon markets to do that for us. I think that the evidence is now clear that what we need is a wholesale reformation of our economic system. This economic system is the core problem, as Naomi Klein has argued so persuasively for so many years. It is a system that rewards people for externalizing the cost of their production and for destroying the planet. They are actually being enriched by their environmentally destructive policies and then using their wealth in order to stop the changes we need or to implement the changes we need uh, to, uh, to, to convert into a sustainable and humane society and a democratic society. We have to, I, I believe we have to come to terms with that. I, I think if we think that the markets are going to save us, we're going to be in deep, deep trouble because that ain't going to happen. We do not have free markets in this country. What we have are rigged markets. We do not have free trade in this world. What we have is managed trade, but it is being managed for the benefit of a multinational elite to the detriment of us all. So I think we need to come to grips with the fact that this is really a, a question of government intervention uh, and uh, aggressive uh, but intelligent action on the part of government to finance a Green New Deal, a rapid and historically important transition to a new way of organizing our economy. And I don't think uh, that any other approach is going to succeed, frankly. So if you, you know, you call that left wing, I mean, you know, whatever it may be, it certainly is not a market oriented approach. And I think, yeah. I think we should yeah. be honest about that. Yeah, no, I, okay. I, I, I appreciate your candor. Thank you. Thank you. David is going to ask the next question. Thank you, Stacy, And thank you, Dimitri, for joining us this evening. Hi, David. I just uh, wanted to run by you here. We could very well be running into an election uh, being called a week before we determine who our leader is going to be. If uh, if uh, Justin Trudeau goes and 
drops the writ after seeing the governor general if his budget doesn't pass. Um, how are you going to prioritize issues when you hit the ground running? And I'm curious how you are going to, to talk to voters to um, have them be able to, uh, to you know, frame you up compared to the other leaders and convince them why they should be getting into our green boat with you and us. Yeah, look, you know, if, the, if their election is called, you know, in the fall, we are going to have huge challenges as a party to, uh, to, uh, to, to be as competitive as we can be. Uh, I think there's some practical things we're going to have to do if that happens, and we're going to have to do them very, very fast. We're going to have to form a shadow cabinet and appoint deputy leaders really quick. And I would like to assemble a national platform committee. And I'd like the members of that com committee, uh, I think that our, our formulation of electoral platform and electoral strategy has been too top down. And I'd like to see this platform committee, I'd like to see its members selected by the EDAs from the various regions around the country. And that that platform committee and that electoral strategy committee would very quickly come together and put together the most effective platform and strategy that we can muster within a short time frame for Canadians. And then it's just a question of getting out, hitting the road, and I think speaking truth to power over and over again and telling Canadians that the core reason why we're here is that we have a political class that is selling out to big business. That's what's happened. That's why we can't get over the hump. And there's no better time to deliver that message, I think, because the pandemic has demonstrated to people the powerfully positive role that government can play in uh, people's lives in a time of extraordinary crisis. And, you know, people see that we have the resources and when government prioritizes the interests of the most vulnerable members of society, it can have a profoundly positive impact. So I, I think this message of, you know, we have to tackle the economic system. We have to tackle the question of inequality. We need to place greater confidence in the government to support the most vulnerable Canadians and ordinary Canadians is it, it could, it, 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 there's a, this is a particularly fortuitous moment for that message to resonate with people. And that would be the core theme, I think, uh, you know, uh, that I would, I would be uh, adopting were I uh, uh, afforded the opportunity to be leader of the party in the next election. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, you are going to ask our next question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so Dimitri, it's kind of, uh, kind of builds on David's question around top down versus bottom up, specifically around how you vision engaging with MPs. Um, I'll be honest, one of the things that drew me to the Green Party is the fact that there are not uh, whipped votes, that MPs currently are encouraged to vote with their constituents. Um, as someone who ran here in Kitchener Centre, it meant that I could be honest with our community that we put our community priorities first and party second, um, while recognizing there is a need for some consistency and that was a bit of a challenge in this past election consistency around our values um, so with that bias stated up front um, curious if you could share any reflections on how you see and any specificity on how you see managing that balance whether you stand behind policy around not having whip votes if not uh, how you'd see it functioning instead and if you do are there any boundary conditions? And if so, how do you um, frame those? Uh, I, 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 I guess I have a mixed approach to this question. Uh, I think that as long as our candidates and our MPs are taking positions that are consistent with the core values, then they should be free to act, uh, and to take whatever positions they feel are uh, you know, in accordance with their own views of the world. But there's a reason why we have a Green Party of Canada. There's, we, we call this, these core values the basis of unity. This is why we've come together in a political organization and we work together uh, in elections and between elections to achieve certain objectives because we are defined by those values. So I, I think we have to, I, I, I as a leader would be inclined to draw the line and say, if you're taking a position that is fundamentally violative of the core values, that's not something that we as a party are going to countenance. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's consistent with the core values of the of the party to deprive women of reproductive rights. And uh, I could not support a candidate or an MP uh, who is arguing uh, for a woman to be deprived of those rights. I think that we have to be firm about this. Uh, you know, if we had a 
if we had, a, I can't imagine this happening, but if we had somebody arguing that we should be selling weapons to a country like Saudi Arabia, I think that's fundamentally violative of our core rights. I think, you know, uh, arguing for the right of Canadians to have assault weapons, that's fundamentally violative of our core rights. But then there's a whole range of issues which are consistent with our core rights, but reasonable people can disagree. There, I think people, MPs should be given the complete latitude to adopt whatever positions they feel you know, are consistent with their own lived experience. Uh, so I wouldn't say, you know, that we take the concept of no whipped votes to an extreme. I think there are certain key things that we have to preserve, the, the, the things that form the basis of our unity. But beyond that, I would, uh, you know, encourage uh, MPs and candidates to be as diverse in their thinking and as, uh, you know, as individualistic as they feel may be appropriate. Yeah, thank you. Reproductive rights is one of the examples I was thinking of from this past election that was really problematic uh, in our community when that was called into question by others outside the party. It, um, yeah, it's, I appreciate the clarity on values and, and so thank you. Thank you. Okay, I asked Jason to, or I invite Jason to ask his question next. Thanks, Stacey. Hi, Dimitri. Good to Hi. be spending some time with us tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping my question will draw a bit on your career. Um, I've heard it claimed that our stock market really doesn't have uh, enough going on to satisfy the appetite of our major pension funds and things like that, and that they're pretty keen to invest in infrastructure, either here or abroad. So, you know, for example, Omers and teachers getting behind high-speed rail in England, that kind of thing. So, do you think that we should be welcoming that kind of private capital into the infrastructure we need, or if it's going to be public purpose infrastructure, do you think it should be purely publicly funded? Well, I, I, I think anything that is essential to the well-being of our citizens should be under democratic control in some form. Uh, you know, and I, I want to stress democratic control. I'm not talking about top-down state nationalization, but people, the people should ultimately have the final say, for example, our public transportation system. I think it is absolutely critical that that be under uh, democratic control. Uh, I, I believe that the internet, that the you know, uh, wireless uh, uh, facilities should be under democratic control. It's so important to, the, to the, the, you know, the flow of information in our society. We need to ensure that it's affordable and accessible to all Canadians, highest quality uh, you know, internet access. So I think that should be under public control. Of course, the healthcare system should be under public control, and we have a creeping privatization happening within our society, which I would resist. Uh, the same thing with our educational system. Personally, I don't think we should have private schools. I don't understand why we have a two-tier educational system. That should be under public control. Um, so with, outside of the sphere of what is essential, absolutely essential to the well-being of our citizens, I think there's a very important role for private enterprise to pay to play. And uh, you know, for a private investment, whether it's coming from teacher's pension fund or a hedge fund uh, to play. But you know, within the realm of what is essential, I think that we have to ensure uh, uh, that the people ultimately determine how those industries are going to be operated. Uh, you know, one thing that's really important to me in that regard is a public savings bank. I think we have to have a state-owned not-for-profit uh, financial institution offering retail services and financing at extremely low rates of interest or no rates of interest for socially productive purposes like housing, affordable housing in uh, poor communities, uh, in racialized communities, uh, supporting clean technologies, uh, supporting the retrofitting of buildings. Uh, and you know, this, public this public savings bank, which I would you know, advocate for being operated through the postal offices of this country, will uh, if, it, if it's actually fulfilling its mandate, force the for-profit banks to offer superior terms to their customers in terms of retail banking fees and interest rates, because they're going to have to do that in order to remain competitive with the public savings bank. So these are, there's, so in some sectors, for example, in finance and banking services, you can have a mix of public ownership and private ownership, but we do have to have a public option available in order to ensure that these banks, which make money hand over fist, are not siphoning huge amounts of money out of the pockets of Canadians, which they've been doing for decades with impunity. Uh, so I'm sorry, it's a bit of a complicated answer, but basically, you know, to distill it down, if, it, if it's essential to the well-being of our citizens, I believe it should be under democratic control. 
I am becoming aware of the time uh, and respecting yours, Dimitri. Are you able to stick around for a couple of more questions? Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kathy, you had a question? Yes, thank you. Um, Dimitri, I wanted to talk a bit about um, electoral reform, specifically proportional representation. It seems to me that, um, and I work with Fair Vote Canada and have done for years, and my understanding and the, what I've learned is that um, with electoral reform and with a, a more proportional representation in Parliament, that a lot of these other goals would, um, it would be easier to achieve because smaller parties and, and there, there, would, there wouldn't be false majorities and, and so on. And I'm sure you're familiar with those things. And so I wonder how in our, um, in our campaign, the Green Party can incorporate um, helping the electorate understand that um, how that's important and and if that's a very strong part of the green platform and a commitment that 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 is a good reason for voting green in order to accomplish all these other things that you're talking about yeah i look uh, like all the candidates i'm sure i'm not alone in this regard i am uh, passionately supportive of a proportional representation system in electoral mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and we have a, a, a detailed statement about this on our website, uh, and I've interacted directly with, uh, you know, uh, members of Fair Vote Canada. I myself was a member for a number of years uh, in order to put together the best platform for advancing the project of electoral reform. Um, so I think we definitely have to continue as a party to be committed to uh, educating uh, our fellow Canadians and stimulating conversation around electoral reform and highlighting the primordial importance of getting rid of this anti-democratic first past the post system that has been so generous to the liberals and conservatives. Um, but I think that the experience of 2015, the election in which I ran, uh, should uh, you know, um, prompt in us a, 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 a sense of realism about what can be accomplished in the, in the current environment. I remember when I was running around London West knocking on doors as a Green Party candidate in 2015, <laughs> that uh, over and over again, told, over and over again, I was told that, uh, you know, I really want to vote green. You guys represent, you know, what I want to see as a matter of conscience, that's where my heart is. But Justin is uh, promising us that if he is elected, he is going to get rid of the first past the post system. And so I'm going to vote liberal this time. And then the next time my vote will count when I cast my vote in favor of the Green Party of Canada. You know, I personally never bought for one second that Justin Trudeau was going to implement a first past the post system because the system has been so incredibly generous to the liberals. And the liberals really at the end of the day at the leadership level are fundamentally about power. This is what they've mastered. They mastered the art of acquiring and retaining power and they know how important the first past the post system is to their ability to do that. And so I think we have to be realistic and understand that they're not gonna give it to us the only way we're ultimately going to get a, a proportional representation system is frankly to have the ability to bring government down if they don't give it to us. So that means we're gonna to have to grow the party without it. We're gonna to have to get enough of a presence within parliament to actually force the issue onto the agenda. Uh, and merely you know, educating the public as important as that is, is not gonna be enough, I'm, I regret to say. I just don't think the liberals or conservatives are going to go that, that path unless we so we as a party have to find ways to grow without the benefit of proportional representation. And once we have enough of a presence in parliament, then we can actually make that happen over the objections of the liberals. Okay, thanks. Uh, and Mina is next. Can you hear me? Yep, hi Mina, how are you doing? Hi, it's Mina Lee. Um, and as a senior, but daughter of a uh, pioneer uh, prairie grain farmer, I would like to hear you talk a little bit more about agriculture. And I know on your platform, you mentioned regenerative agriculture, which I'm totally in favor of, but we've got to get to the specifics. Like Harper eliminated the wheat pool. We've seen farmers dumping milk, the egg market, hogs, 
Have you got anything specific about agriculture? Uh, well, a number of things. We have a, we have a platform that calls uh, for uh, encouraging uh, a plant-based diet through a series of subsidies and public education and moving away from uh, a meat-based diet to the maximum possible degree. Uh, and I think that's going to require government support. I think we, we were really focused on localizing agricultural production and not relying upon uh, other jurisdictions uh, for uh, you know, essential foodstuffs, and particularly in the time of climate crisis, uh, that, is a, that, is an, that is a system of global agriculture that we need to change because of the carbon footprint of that system. Um, so I, you know, I think we should be promoting regenerative farming, as you mentioned. I think we should be promoting local, uh, promoting through subsidies and regulation, local production of essential products, agricultural products, and, um, and getting away from factory farming to the greatest possible degree and moving to a plant-based diet. So I think those are the, broadly speaking, the objectives, uh, you know, and you can learn more by going to our, our uh, environmental platform. We have a whole section there on the agricultural system. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll put one last call out to see if anybody has any last question. Uh, it looks like James has another question. Hi, Hi James. Um, Hi, James. You're clearly a passionate and dynamic guy, right? And I think this is something the Green Party absolutely needs. What role do you see if you don't win? Uh, well, uh, if it comes to running for office, I'm going to have to consult my partner, but he does about that because if, if after seven months of, the I, seven, under I understand that better than you know. So I will tell you if it's up, if it were up to me alone and I, uh, you know, I didn't have to take into account the extraordinary sacrifices that my partner Fadida has made during the last seven months, I would run in, for office in the next election for the Green Party without any hesitation. Uh, and hopefully, you know, she'll be minded to continue to support me uh, in that regard. Uh, I think she will, uh, but I would have to, you know, ensure that she was comfortable with that. Um, beyond that, whatever, you know, whether I run for office or not, and I says, as I say, I think I will, and I will certainly want to, uh, I will support the party in any way I can. You know, I will support the party through public advocacy. Uh, I will support the party through ground, uh, you know, uh, grassroots organizing on the ground. Uh, through using whatever profile I have to promote the Green Party's agenda and, uh, you know, uh, alerting Canadians to the many wonderful things that this party has to offer. I'll support candidates. I'll support the, the you know, I think that all of the leadership candidates, whoever wins this thing, should all form part of Shadow Cabinet. Uh, and they should be, you know, a core part of the decision-making structures of this party. I mean, we've gotten to know each other so well. I think there's a mutual respect, a profound mutual respect. We work very uh, respectfully together, uh, there's a high degree of civility and, um, and, and sort of cross-pollination of views. So I think that uh, I, I would be supportive of any person in this leadership contest who wins and do whatever I could to ensure that person is the most effective leader possible. And I, I, and I know I'm, I'm not alone in that regard. I think, you know, I think all the other leadership candidates feel that way. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, mutual respect obvious in the candidates that, have, that I've seen speak. And to, to lose anybody simply because they, they didn't win would be a disaster for us. And so I think it's just important Absolutely. that we see that you know, uh, uh, people who have come to the level that you've got to stick around and, and keep pushing the, the, the message forward. So that's a great response. Thanks. Thank you. So I, I have, if there's one more question, I, uh, I have time. Well, actually, maybe even one or two. I could go to 8.15. Uh, so I don't want to hold you all up, but if there is one or two more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, I think uh, I think there's one last question, and that is Andrews. Hi, everyone. Hi, Dimitri. Uh, thank you for putting this conversation together. And Dimitri, uh, thank you for taking the time out of uh, what I understand is already a very busy schedule uh, to join us tonight. Uh, definitely grateful to listen to the conversation and everyone's questions. Uh, Dimitri, I understand you recently released uh, your foreign policy platform. Um, and I'd be curious if you could expand on how you anticipate uh, your for, how your foreign policy would be a departure from uh, current and uh, historical Canadian foreign policy, especially in relation to the United States, which, which has been our most important trading partner 
but uh, also has been uh, someone who has led us to support uh, egregious human rights abuses in uh, Saudi Arabia, um, mm -hmm. in Israel, Palestine, um, in wars uh, throughout the 20th century. So keeping in mind uh, their importance to Canadians economically and culturally, um, how would you sort of straddle that balance between uh, maintaining good relations with the United States, but also uh, upholding uh, human rights, not just uh, in word, but also in action? Thank you. This is a subject, uh, as you probably know, Andrew, which is uh, very dear and near to my heart. And uh, I, I just sort of looking at the problem from a big picture level, I don't think that we can solve the climate emergency without an unprecedented level of international cooperation. And we can't solve the existential threat posed by nuclear weapons, which hardly is talked about at all anymore, even though, you know, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists has put the doomsday clock to the closest point to midnight in our lifetimes. You know, our politicians hardly talk about the threat of a nuclear disaster. Um, so how are we going to solve these problems which require international cooperation without changing the nature of international relations profoundly? I don't think we can. So we really got to get a grip on this problem right now. And from the perspective of our country, um, you know, I think to be perfectly blunt about it, that Canada on the international stage for most of the post-World War II period has acted like a servant of the United States government. Our foreign policy has essentially mimicked with a couple of notable exceptions like the Iraq war. It has essentially mim mimicked US government foreign policy. And US government foreign policy can basically be understood with this simple principle. If you are deemed by the United States government to be a regime or a government that is going to promote the US government's agenda of global hegemony, because that's what it is, then you are given a free pass when it comes to human rights violations in international law. If, however, you're deemed to be an obstacle to the US project, the US government project of global hegemony, you are held to the highest standard of inter international law and human rights. And your, you know, your, 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 your human rights violations are either exaggerated or constantly highlighted whilst the official friends of the United States are permitted to get away with the most egregious atrocities. You mentioned the case of Israel, which according to Elizabeth May, and I agree with her, is committing the crime of apartheid against the Palestinian people. The Saudi regime, which is arguably the most horrific human rights violator in the world, we are selling deadly weapons to that regime. We support the dictator of Egypt. We are in the Lima group with Honduras, whose President Juan Orlando Hernandez in 2017 brazenly stole the election. We're in the Lima group with the government of Ivan Duque of Colombia, which is by far the most dangerous state for land defenders on the planet, with Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil. You know, our, our, human, our, our, our foreign policy is a wreckage of hypocrisy, and we've lost all credibility on the international stage because of our subservience to U.S. foreign policy. So I would adopt the approach that human rights are universal. International law is of universal application. All victims are equal and all oppressors must be held accountable in accordance with due process. Now, I have no illusions about how hard that's gonna be because of our interdependence with the United States government. That is going to be a difficult thing to disentangle ourselves from. And it's been made much harder by the fact that successive conservative and liberal governments have enmeshed us ever more with the U.S. economy and made us increasingly dependent upon the vagaries of the U.S. government. But we have allies in the United States. There are people in the United States who agree with this critique of U.S. government foreign policy, and more and more of them are getting elected to Congress. So there's people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Rashida Tlaib and Ilan Omar and uh, Elena Presley and Senator Merkley and Bernie Sanders. These are people who are gaining increasing influence in the United States, who want a humane and principled US government foreign policy. And we need to foster relationships with them. And we need to communicate to the American people that we don't view them as our enemies. They are our brothers and sisters. Many of them are being oppressed by the same government that I'm criticizing. So within the United States, we have to find our allies where we can and deepen our relationships to them. Uh, I think more and more Americans are of the view that their government's foreign policy is deeply destructive and anti-democratic. Um, and then we need to find allies on the international stage. 
And I think that we as a country should be developing an alliance of non-belligerent states. There are countries that are very, whose governments are very, very receptive to the type of critique I'm talking about. The countries of Scandinavia, Ireland, New Zealand, South Africa, and we need to build this international alliance of, of uh, non-belligerent states. And, and uh, also we need to diversify our trade relationships and to the greatest possible degree, reduce our economic interdependence on the United States. This is going to be a project that's gonna take years uh, to, uh, to achieve. And it's gonna to have to be done with great delicacy because of our vulnerability to the US government. Uh, but it is one that we have to embark upon as quickly as possible, I think, if we're gonna be serious about solving the crises that confront us. Well, thank you so much for um, all of the time that you've been willing to share with us and your thoughtful answers. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's been a great evening. Matt's has posted uh, our upcoming Q&A sessions. We have Glenn Murray tomorrow evening, actually. Uh, Courtney Howard the next, and then Miriam Haddad the following week, uh, all on Wednesdays. Um, and uh, just let us know if you are not already subscribed to watch all of them. Um, and uh, Dimitri, do you want to repeat again how people can connect with you or find your information? Yeah, thank you, Stacey. So uh, please go to uh, teamdimitri.ca. Um, and uh, I, I recommend you start by going to the team page. So you can see who the people are who have been helping put together this platform because they're really an amazing group of people. And then you can dig down into the nitty gritty of the platform uh, and find out more about the policies that we're putting forward. And uh, if you're not a member of the party, my suspicion is that everybody in this call already is a member of the party. But if you're not a member of the party, uh, you, can, you, you, you need to sign up by September 3rd in order to be eligible to vote. And uh, you can do that uh, if, you do, if you're supporting my campaign, just hit the donate button on my team, uh, Dimitri website, or if you're supporting somebody else or want to support somebody else, go to the membership page on the Green Party website and uh, you can sign up there in a matter of minutes. Uh, but whatever you do, um, I wanna thank you all for your engagement, whether you support me or any other candidate. Uh, uh, you know, Ultimately, the strength of this party lies in its membership and it's a privilege to speak to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Have a good evening. Thank you.